The Tale of Matsyapur, a story from a collection of fables called Songs of Water and Songs of Ash, written by Mir Umar Hassan and translated into English by Anuradha Majumdar. From the north of the unruly peaks of Hindu Kush, across the frozen valley of Abruj, there travelled a great Pasha who had been ruinously defeated in battle by his uncle. After a brutal siege that had lasted the entire month of Shaban, the Pasha was usurped and condemned to exile by his uncle's court. Since the reign of his usurper extended to all points of the compass except the south, where there stood the insurmountable Hindu Kush, the Pasha decided to venture south. Guided by the travelogue of a dubious scholar, he decided to seek refuge in the lands beyond the infernal mountains, amidst the great plains of the Brahmaputra or the Jumbali Nadi, if he could reach those fertile and fabled lands. With his army torn to pieces and his personal guard and household murdered, the Pasha was allowed to leave his wooden palace with naught but that which he and his wife could carry. And while the Pasha hoisted spears and schematos, ruby and crusted shields and ebony javelins upon his back, his wife, Mokhduma Begum, who was wise as the Pasha was brave, took only as many illuminated manuscripts from her library as she could carry. And thus, laden with books and arms, they braved the terrible mountain passes of the Hindu Kush. They traversed ravines deep as the sea and lakes where entire armies had frozen inside the water. From Abruj to Hoka, from Hoka to Gedal, they travelled, pursued by petty soldiers of his uncle, who would not let them turn back. They scrambled over the backs of the mountains and saw an eternity entombed in the sky. They walked through a forest of icicles and shards of rocks, large as the turrets of a mosque, where they heard the wind screaming an ungodly azan through cracks in the ice. As the Pasha and the Begum scrolled their way through the mountain passes, where roads turned upon themselves and passages appeared and disappeared each day, they were forced to sell all their finery and vestments and their jewelled rings of office and birth at small way stations and sarais to pay for stale bread and slivers of dried meat that nonetheless kept them alive. And so, dressed in the garb of the destitute, they travelled for seven waning moons and a hundred listless suns, and reached the outskirts of the town of Putkipur, on the banks of the Buder, a small tributary of the great Jumbali Nadi. It was the month of monsoon, and the rains drummed down on a red earth, spilling mud and washing sins with vigorous energy. Here, the Pasha and his Begum set up a rude camp beneath a lush banyan tree. And the next morning, the Begum and the Pasha climbed the branches of the tree and listened to the various voices that drifted on an unfamiliar wind. For nine moons and nine days, they stayed atop the tree, eating what berries were brought to them by fruit bats, until their abruji tongues could catch the lilt of the local Bhasha and their abruji ears recognize the sounds of that land. And by such ingenious methods, they learnt the shouts of the marching armies and they heard whispers of betrayal from neighbouring kingdoms where the rulers were weak. They heard the greed of the money lenders and the corpulence of the magistrates. They heard the songs of the farmer at work and learnt the names of his crops. They learnt the rhythmic steps of the palanquin bearers and the chants of the silversmiths. All this and much more they heard on the wind and in the gossip of the fruit bats. Until one day, from the morass of this noise, a keen lament was heard, and the Pasha discovered that a great calamity had befallen the denizens of some city on the bank of the Jumbali. With a glint in his eye, the Pasha leapt down the tree, saying, Come, my dearest Begum, this is our chance to gain glory again, restore our wealth and our pride. And both the beggar men he jumped into the great shield he had carried all the way from Abruj, letting it float on the swift monsoon current of the river, knowing that it would eventually feed into the great maw of the Jumbali Nadi. Soon they reached the mouth of the river where the cries had emanated from, and surely enough 
There on the bank stood rows upon rows of people, sari clad women with cooking fires cradled on their heads, men in colorful lungis with telegraph poles on their backs, old men with lanterns made from giant cucumbers, children atop tame tigers and elephants, and each one of them, including the elephants, wailing and crying and beating their breasts at the misfortune. Whatever is the matter? cried the Pasha, his voice regaining some of the command of his youth. Why do you cry when no wolves chase you, when no uncles betray you, when there is no ice in this land and you do not starve? Oh, stranger, for you must be a stranger to our lands to ask such a question, cried an old man in reply. Had you arrived here but a day ago, you would have seen instead of this barren land pointing to the banks of the river that were indeed devoid of trees as far as the eye could see. A thriving metropolis, the greatest city the world has ever known. Why, here where I stand, there stood a lighthouse made of cobwebs and there, pointing further away, was the invisible courthouse made of wax. In the centre of the town was an alabaster hammam with a great dome made of soap and copper. And in the east was a rookery the size of a mountain that was hoisted by hempen ropes as thick as a langur. There were bazaars that sold nutmeg and cardamom and warehouses full of polythene and pomegranate. And there were karkhanas where we made the finest figurines of onyx, each smaller than a thumbnail. What could possibly happen to such a town in a single day? cried the Pasha in astonishment. It is a sad tale, Sahib, but it was the great fish himself who came to claim this town. I have saved you from floods and I have given you breath. I taught you the scriptures and I wrote your destinies on your ear lobes. I gave you pearls for wealth and reason to know when to use them. I gave you fire and the sky and I gave you a land to live upon for my scales that have fallen became earth itself. All I ask in return is not to be forgotten, but I see now that terror is the only memory that persists. The big eat the little, that alone is law. The strong eat the weak, that alone is law. The fish eat the people, that alone is law. And the great fish, having said this, swallowed a town in a single gulp. All the havelis and streets and hovers and opium dens disappeared into his gullet. Upon hearing this, the Pasha despaired and felt like joining in the wailing himself. For of all the weapons he had lugged halfway across the earth, none would do him any good against a giant fish. He could fight bhaktus and demons, fight armies of men and hojis and elephants and demigods with his weapons, but how was he to fight a fish? At this, Makhduma Begum, with her arm reassuringly upon her, the Pasha said, Why don't you row us out to where the Jumbali River meets the sea? For they were still seated upon the floating shield, and I shall deal with the fish. And so the Pasha did as the Begum commanded, and rowed them to the mouth of the river, where sure enough the great fish was resting, with its glittering fin the size of an island, protruding above the water. O oh, Matsya, for that was the name of the fish, grant us an audience, O oh, great one, and we shall remember you. Emerge from your watery abode, and we shall remember you. Answer our prayers, O oh, fish among fish, and we shall remember you, cried the Begum, loud as she could. And suddenly, with a snort that shot a plume, Straight into the sky, there emerged a giant fish from the water, each scale the size of an elephant and each dazzling in its brilliance. It blinked its lidless eyes and boomed. What do you want, mortal? Have I not given you enough? I have saved you from floods and I have given you breath. I taught you the scriptures and I, oh, we are very grateful for all that, said the Begum quickly before the great fish decided that they were little enough to be swallowed whole. It is why we bring you great offerings to swallow, for we venerate you and are thankful for all that you have given us. We bring you cities such as you have never seen before, 
full of domes that are easy to gulp, with castles that float in the air and factories and houses. What folly is this? Where are these cities you speak of? Give them to me now, or I shall swallow you both. And at this, the Begum opened the illustrated books that she had assiduously carried in a bundle on her head all the way from Abruj. Each book contained a fable beautifully wrought <clears throat> on fine vellum. And in each book, there were countless illustrations of towns, each gilded and painted and traced with delicate strokes and glorious colors. The great fish was entranced by the splendors of the cities he saw on the pages, for the master miniaturists of Abruj were indeed some of the greatest painters who ever lived. Oh, tiny Begum, you honor me with such gifts, but how am I to eat so many wonderful and delectable cities when I have just consumed an entire town? Paltry though it was compared to the ones that you now bring me, bemoaned Matsya. But are these cities not a more appropriate meal for one so great as you? Heave the town from your stomach and eat these cities instead. And that is how the town was returned to the people and the Pasha to his pride, for he became the Sardar of the town, which from then on came to be called Matsyapur, in honour of the great fish, lest someone forget it. The Begum, who had lost all her books to the fish, became mistress of the greatest etile in the land. Her first task was to commission a great manuscript that described a mythical country larger than any one city or town or even a kingdom, a grand illusion so vast and so complete that it may be safely fed to the fish to replete him were he to ever return. And though the tale of the Pasha and the Begum has long been forgotten, and though Matsyapur itself has disappeared in time, the great mythical country illustrated in the Begum's atelier continues to exist and is known today by the name of Hindustan.